July 10th. I found the workmen this morning much disturbed in mind about the howling of the dogs. We don't like it, sir, one of them said to me. We don't like it. There was some at abroad last night that was unholy. They were still more uncomfortable when the news came round that a large dog had made a raid upon a flock of sheep, scattering them far and wide and leaving three of them dead with torn throats in the field. When I told the rector of what I had seen and what was being said in the village, he immediately decided that we must try and catch, or at least identify, the beast I had seen. Of course, said he, it is some dog lately imported into the neighborhood, for I know of nothing about here nearly as large as the animal you describe, though its size may be due to the deceptive moonlight. This afternoon I asked the rector, as a favor, to assist me in lifting the temporary cover that was on the tomb, giving as an excuse the reason that I wished to obtain a portion of the curious mortar with which it had been sealed. After a slight demur he consented, and we raised the lid. If the sight that met our eyes gave me a shock, at least it appalled Grant. "'Great God!' he exclaimed. "'The woman is alive!' And so it seemed for a moment. The corpse had lost much of its starved appearance and looked hideously fresh and alive. It was still wrinkled and shrunken, but the lips were firm and of the rich red hue of health. The eyes, if possible, were more appalling than ever, though fixed and staring. At one corner of the mouth I thought I noticed a slight dark-colored froth, but I said nothing about it then. "'Take your piece of mortar, Harry,' gasped Grant, "'and let us shut the tomb again. God help me, parson though I am, such dead faces frighten me.' Nor was I sorry to hide that terrible face again. But I got my bit of mortar, and I have advanced a step towards the solution of the mystery. This afternoon the tomb was moved several feet towards its new position, but it will be two or three days yet before we shall be ready to replace the slab. 10.15 p.m. Again the same howling at sunset, the same fog enveloping the church, and at ten o'clock the same great beast slipping silently out into the open country. I must get the rector's help and watch for its return, but precautions we must take, for if things are as I believe, we take our lives in our hands when we venture out into the night to waylay the vampire. Why not admit it at once? For the beast I have seen is the vampire of that evil thing in the tomb, I can have no reasonable doubt. Not yet come to its full strength, thank heaven, after the starvation of nearly two centuries, for at present it can only maraud as wolf, apparently. But in a day or two, when full power returns, that dreadful woman in new strength and beauty will be able to leave her refuge. Then it would not be sheep merely that would satisfy her disgusting lust for blood, but victims that would yield their life-blood without a murmur to her caressing touch, victims that, dying of her foul embrace, themselves must become vampires, in their turn to prey on others. Mercifully, my knowledge gives me a safeguard, for that little piece of mortar that I rescued today from the tomb contains a portion of the sacred host, and who holds it, humbly and firmly believing in its virtue, may pass safely through such an ordeal as I intend to submit myself and the rector to tonight. 12.30. Our adventure is over for the present, and we are back safe. After writing the last entry recorded above, I went off to find Grant and tell him that the marauder was out on the prowl again. But Grant, I said, before we start out tonight, I must insist that you will let me persecute this affair in my own way. You must promise to put yourself completely under my orders without asking any questions as to the why and wherefore. After a little demur and some excusable chaff on his part, at the serious view I was taking of what he called a dog hunt, he gave me his promise. I then told him that we were to watch tonight and try and track the mysterious beast, but not to interfere with it in any way. I think, in spite of his jests, that I impressed him with the fact that there might be, after all, good reason for my precautions. It was just after eleven when we stepped out into the still night, our first move was to try and penetrate the dense fog round the church. But there was something so chilly about it, and a faint smell so disgustingly rank and loathsome, 
that neither our nerves nor our stomachs were proof against it. Instead, we stationed ourselves in the dark shadow of a yew tree that commanded a good view of the wicked entrance to the churchyard. At midnight the howling of the dogs began again, and in a few minutes we saw a large gray shape with green eyes shining like lamps shamble swiftly down the path toward us. The rector started forward, but I laid a firm hand upon his arm and whispered a warning, Remember! Then we both stood very still and watched as the great beast cantered swiftly by. It was real enough, for we could hear the clicking of its nails on the stone flags. It passed within a few yards of us, and seemed to be nothing more nor less than a great gray wolf, thin and gaunt, with bristling hair and dripping jaws. It stopped where the mist commenced and turned round. It was truly a horrible sight, and made one's blood run cold. The eyes burnt like fires. The upper lip was snarling and raised, showing the great canine teeth, while round the mouth clung and dripped a dark-colored froth. It raised its head and gave tongue to its long wailing howl, which was answered from afar by the village dogs. After standing a few moments, it turned and disappeared into the thickest part of the fog. Very shortly afterwards, the atmosphere began to clear, and within ten minutes the mist was all gone, the dogs in the village were silent, and the night seemed to reassume its normal aspect. We examined the spot where the beast had been standing and found Plainly enough upon the stone flags, dark spots of froth and saliva. Well, Rector, I said, will you admit now, in view of the things you have seen today, in consideration of the legend, the woman in the tomb, the fog, the howling dogs, and last but not least, the mysterious beast you have seen so close, that there is something not quite normal in it all? Will you put yourself unreservedly in my hands and help me whatever I may do, to first make assurance doubly sure, and finally take the necessary steps for putting an end to this horror of the night? I saw that the uncanny influence of the night was strong upon him, and wished to impress it as much as possible. Needs must, he replied, when the devil drives, and in the face of what I have seen, I must believe that some unholy forces are at work. Yet how can they work in the sacred precincts of a church? Shall we not call rather upon heaven to assist us in our need? Grant, I said solemnly, that we must do, each in his own way. God helps those who help themselves, and by his help and the light of my knowledge, we must fight this battle for him and the poor lost soul within. We then returned to the rectory and to our rooms though I have set up to write this account while the scene is fresh in my mind. July 11th. Found the workmen again very much disturbed in their minds, and full of a strange dog that had been seen during the night by several people who had hunted it. Farmer Stockman, who had been watching his sheep, the same flock that had been raided the night before, had surprised it over a fresh carcass and tried to drive it off, but its size and fierceness so alarmed him that he had beaten a hasty retreat for a garden. When he returned, the animal was gone, though we found that three more sheep from his flock were dead and torn. The Sarah tomb was moved today to its new position, but it was a long, heavy business, and there was not time to replace the covering slab. For this I was glad, as in the prosaic light of day, the rector almost disbelieves the events of the night and is prepared to think everything to have been magnified and distorted by our imagination. As, however, I could not possibly proceed with my war of extermination against this foul thing without assistance, and as there is nobody else I can rely upon, I appealed to him for one more night to convince him that it was no delusion, but a ghastly, horrible truth which must be fought and conquered for our own sakes as well as that of all those living in the neighborhood. Put yourself in my hands, Rector, I said, for tonight at least. Let us take those precautions which my study of the subject tells me are the right ones. Tonight you and I must watch in the church. 
and I feel assured that tomorrow you will be as convinced as I am and be equally prepared to take those awful steps which I know to be proper, and I must warn you that we shall find a more startling change in the body lying there than you noticed yesterday. My words came true, for on raising the wooden cover once more, the rank stench of a slaughterhouse arose, making us feel positively sick. Barely the vampire, but how changed from the starved and shrunken corpse we saw two days ago for the first time. The wrinkles had almost disappeared, the flesh was firm and full, the crimson lips grinned horribly over the long pointed teeth, and a distinct smear of blood had trickled down one corner of the mouth. We set our teeth, however, and hardened our hearts. Then we replaced the cover and put what we had collected into a safe place in the vestry. Yet even now Grant could not believe that there was any real or pressing danger concealed in that awful tomb, as he raised strenuous objections to any apparent desecration of the body without further proof. This he shall have tonight. God grant that I am not taking too much on myself. If there was any truth in old legends, it would be easy enough to destroy the vampire now, but Grant will not have it. I hope for the best of this night's work, but the danger in waiting is very great.